wanted to first touch base with, we're gonna do a microneedling of the face and the neck. Uh, we're gonna go through all the procedures, the protocols, but I wanted to go first through the products that we're gonna be using for microneedling. Uh, first and foremost, why people get microneedling, why people are, are they're a, everyone's after that fountain of youth. They want something that makes them look younger, but natural, okay? And the only way when our bodies stop developing collagen at about 25, 30 years of age is the fact that the only way to rebuild collagen is through an injury, okay? Now you can do that multiple ways. You can do that through a laser, you can do it through a, a chemical peel, or you can do it through microneedling. The beauty of microneedling is the fact that you're not using heat or chemicals. That immediately opens up your market. So you can do a Fitzpatrick one through six with a microneedling pen with a device because you're not using heat or chemicals to create that injury. So what we're gonna do is a microneedling procedure on her and I'm gonna go through a lot of the processes, the procedures, a lot of the tips and tricks, the nuances, where people find the most discomfort and how you can avoid that. Uh, and then by all means throughout, just ask some questions as you wish. We're using as our standard gliding agent is our 100% hyaluronic acid. This is a great because of the viscosity for gliding of the, the, of the pen. What we have as well is before every procedure, you wanna make sure that you have your clients use a cleanser as well as a uh, uh, exfoliant. Exfoliant obviously is to take care of the la several layers of skin, dead skin on the surface of the skin, and a cleanser to get rid of all any remaining makeup or foundation or what have you. So that's first and foremost. Um, what we have as well is we've got a vitamin C repair. So what I explain to folks is that when you're doing a microneedling procedure, you are literally putting thousands of holes in the skin, okay? Whatever said patient is putting on their skin immediately post-procedure is critical because it's not just gonna stay on the surface and maybe absorb, it's gonna get sucked down into the dermis. So you wanna be very careful about what you're putting on the skin. No makeup, period, at least until they get home, they shower, what have you. The other key piece to this is you wanna hydrate. Hydration is key to this. It's as though you aerate your lawn, but then you don't water it, it's gonna die. What'll happen here is if you don't hydrate the skin immediately post-procedure for the next several days, you're gonna get, the skin's gonna to start to flake off and you're gonna have clients come back and call you and say, listen, I'm, I'm peeling and this and that. It's just an added nuance that you can avoid by just keeping the skin hydrated, okay? And finally, one of our pieces is our human epidermal growth factor. So growth factor is key in the rehabilitation of skin, okay? You're hearing a lot about PRP with clients. That's when they take your blood, they spin it down, and they take that platelet-rich plasma. In that plasma is a lot of growth factors, okay? This is our human epidermal growth factor. This focuses on the skin. This is what helps with the healing process. Once you do a microneedling procedure, the healing cascade starts. This is absolutely critical to really expediting that process, okay? Uh, when we're finished, we're gonna put on several different post-procedure masks. We've got a cryo mask and we've got a growth factor infused mask. Uh, that's, like I said, when we have those thousands of holes, it is critical to put something on where whatever gets absorbed is gonna actually do some good as opposed to doing any kind of hindrance, okay? When doing a face, and that's gonna be your most common procedure, and while we have a training video on the face, one thing I wanna make sure that is very clear is that microneedling is great for backs of the hands. It's, it's fantastic for that. For acne scarring or any scarring, whether it's a cesarean, whether it's from a trauma, whether it's from an accident, a surgery, um, a microneedling device is absolutely uh, phenomenal for taking care of scarring. Just so we're clear, so what microneedling does is it creates a micro injury. And what that injury does is it causes the body to start the healing cascade, which in turn starts the healing process or the collagen reformation, collagen induction. So you're growing fresh skin from within. So when it helps to mitigate fine lines and wrinkles, that's exactly what's happening, is it's just growing fresh skin from within. So these come sterile packaged in 10 vials, and this is our human growth factor. What I generally do is take one vial, and it's, uh, you can, there's four mLs in here, so it's basically one per patient. Once you pop the top, you're gonna pour it in, and you can see the viscosity of this. We call this basically PRP in a bottle. 
So what you're getting is 100% pure epidermal growth factor that's uh, consistent bottle to bottle, vial to vial. Once I'm done doing this, I then take it and I put it upside down with the cap on it and just leave it upside down because you'll get about another mill if you let it sit and just all work its way down. Then from this, I go ahead and I'll add a couple of pumps of HA. This is about all I'm gonna need for this procedure, okay? You saw that, about three mLs and a couple of pumps of HA, and this should last me most of the procedure. So what I do is once I'm working, I leave this in a little shot cup over here, and what I do is my, my pen is here. I always keep the pen in this hand, and I work with this hand over here on my Mayo stand. So anything I need to grab, to use, to what have you, I use this hand. This hand stays on the pen constantly. Do your very best, it is difficult, but do your best not to mix the two. Because the minute I start doing HA in here, and then I reach over here, and I turn the pen, and we're gonna put our protective sleeve on here shortly, my esteemed colleague. So once you do that, and you start to get HA over the pen and the sleeve, everything becomes slippery, it just becomes a, a little less um, dialed in. First off, with the pen, we have a corded device. When you're doing any volume of microneedling, and anybody will tell you this, you want a cord, not a battery powered. The one advantage of battery powered is this more convenient. And I will, I will say that to the days, days long, is that having a battery powered is more convenient. But that's about it. When your battery runs about 70, 80%, so is your pen. So the two key components to microneedling that affect the outcome and affect the patient experience is a slow motor and a dull needle, okay? So a lot of the infatuation with microneedling now has led to the Chinese flooding the market with needles. So while there's less expensive needles out there, you're gonna find that they get dull very quickly. And what happens is it'll pluck the skin when it starts coming out of the skin, and that can become painful for the patient. The second is a fast motor. When your pen is running 70 or 80% to power on a battery powered, you're only going 70, 80% with that motor in the pen. And of course, there's the recharging and what have you to make sure you maintain that. So we have a corded pen. I prefer to have it around my neck like this. Uh, I was in a dentist's office who has taken on aesthetics and started doing this and he has a clip that he just clips his cord right here. That's another key component that uh, I should have had here with this, but I would encourage that. It just makes life a lot easier. Um, so what we do is we go ahead and take our needle. These are sterile packaged, one a piece, disposable, one time use. And we just click it on here like this and we're good. So what you want to do is you're going to find that there's a speed component down here. This one, you want to turn it all the way up. Hear that? You want to stay at four always. Yeah. And then down here is your depth gauge. So zero to 2.5 millimeters, okay? So once you've put the needle cartridge on, you then wanna take your protective sheath and slide it over the top, like so. And just slide it down, all the way down to about there. When you go over it, it stays on. So you wanna stay just above it like this. And then you just take your sheath, your protective sleeve, and you pull this off. And then by here, you just basically work it down like so. Now we're ready to begin the procedure. The way I do it is I frame, I always stand at the head of the patient. And I'm always gonna start with the forehead and work my way down, do the periorbitals, the cheeks, and then the chin. When doing this, the most uncomfortable position for the patient is the forehead mm -hmm. and the upper lip. So what I do is when you have patients numb uh, prior to the procedure, I go ahead and have them numb the lips as well, okay? You don't have to cake it on, but just do this. The reason for that is, of course, when you're doing the upper lip, if you have the upper lip numb, but you haven't done the lips, once you cross that vermilion border, it can be uncomfortable for the patient. It's uncomfortable already just doing the upper lip. Okay, 
once I'm done with the forehead, I explain to patients, okay, that was the hardest part. So then they begin to think, okay, this is cakewalk, I can do this. You do the, the crow's feet, you do the periorbitals, you do the cheeks, the, none of that's uncomfortable. Then you hit the upper lip real quick and you do that. And a lot of times they're gonna be, ooh, ah, 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 all of that. But when you're done with that, you're done. It's, it's smooth sailing the rest of the, the, this is all relatively pretty easy, as well as the chin uh, and the lower lip, okay? So I take my hand here and I just dip a finger. And what I do is I break it down into quadrants. So I'm gonna do her right forehead here first. I always start at 0.5, okay? So we are at 0.5. Now, a lot of people ask me, how deep do I go here? How deep do I go there? The idea here is to create injury. It's to get that pinpoint bleeding. So the depth varies patient to patient, skin to skin, and as well within the same patient. So I often have times where I have to explain that sometimes a patient's right side of the face is gonna have heavier skin than the left side. And that can be a simple fact as they drive to work every single day and the sun beats down on that one side of their face and then the sun crosses over and it starts to set in the west and they're driving home and that same sun is beating down, you will find that some patients have thicker skin on one side of the face versus the other. And that's a, that's a predominant reason why. So what I do is I go ahead and start at 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is always a good safe starting zone for doing microneedling. And what I do is notice the back of my pen is always going to be perpendicular to the skin, okay? This is not microneedling the forehead. This is how you want to do this, okay? So always keep a close eye on the back of the pen as well as my other hand, okay? I'm always touching the patient, you know, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, wherever I'm working. So what I'm going to do here is at 0.5, I always lay the pen down first. You don't need to just dive right in. So lay it down, okay? So this is about the speed that you want to go. You don't need to go any faster. You don't want to go any slower, okay? And what I do is I'll do a couple of passes like this, okay? Now, one thing I want you to make be aware of is that a lot of folks have a ridge right in here, okay? When you have that, you're gonna skip if you try to do the full forehead in this direction. So you wanna take it and you wanna go this direction. That's where you're gonna get the best benefit. Now, I just did two quick passes and I realized that I'm not getting my pinpoint bleeding. Prior to dialing up to one millimeter, I will then press a little bit harder. So this is still at 0.5, I haven't made any adjustments. I'm gonna come back in and you're gonna see here that I'll probably more than likely get the pinpoint bleeding I'm after, okay? I'm gonna go along this ridge right here, okay? How you doing? Good. Okay, so this is without any adjustment. And unlike a laser, when you're doing microneedling, you can go back over and hit the same area over and over and over again. Okay, that's what I'm after. I did not adjust my pen, but I've got this nice pinpoint bleeding, okay? I have now created the injury that's gonna create or trigger that healing cascade. The body is gonna start sending the white blood cells, the growth factor, everything. We have an injury, let's start rebuilding collagen, let's start healing this, okay? So we're done on this forehead. What I'm gonna do is then I'm gonna step over here and I'm gonna do the other side. Okay, same idea. Yeah. Now I know from the previous side that I need to add a little bit of, of pressure to my pen, okay? That's a great question. So the question was, what about the hairline? Uh, let me just explain. You, as the clinician, want to administer the numbing cream yourself. If you send the patient into the bathroom here, put this on, most of the time they won't get near the hairline. Then all of a sudden they get in the chair, they've wiped off the numbing cream, and you start doing a procedure and you're going up into the hairline. Well, guess who's uncomfortable? Not you, the patient. Always administer the numbing cream up into the hairline. This has no effect on the hair as far as it falling out or doing anything like that. Uh, quite the contrary, we have, uh, there's growth factors now and PRP for hair restoration, 
okay? So you can start to trigger uh, hair regrowth. So I'm gonna put a little bit more HA. Notice the back of my pen. It's like a windshield wiper, okay? This is exactly what you want. And I got my other hand here. And I'm gonna do a little diagonal. Okay. So, we're done with our forehead. Once you're done with the forehead, and we've done this at 0.5, you will find that most of the time, your periorbitals are also 0.5. So what I do is I jump down and I do those right now, okay? So I don't have to adjust my pen. So I'm gonna come down and let me just do underneath the eyes. And by periorbital, what I'm saying is above the zygomatic bone, the cheekbone, okay? Anything below that's the cheek, anything above we consider periorbital. The reason why you don't ever wanna go across that is because of course there's a giant cheekbone and it can affect the um, positioning of the pen. So I'm gonna come down here and with my left hand, I'm gonna pull the skin, okay? And you can move the head as you wish. Um, you're right up next to the um, the lower part of the eyelid. Okay. Now, one thing to be aware of is that. Some patients will form he little hematomas, little blood blisters, right around the, uh, just below the eye. You can almost bet when someone comes in with really, really, really thin skin, they've had a bunch of procedures, lasers, CO2s, all of that, they will develop a couple of little blood blisters and hematomas. Set the expectation. You may get a little blood blister or two, it will go away in a few days, but set that expectation always. She won't, because she's, She's not prone to that. I'm gonna step over here and I'm gonna do the other side. Again, just a finger. And I come up in here. And by and large, let the pen do the work, okay? I added a little bit of pressure on the forehead because I didn't necessarily know, I knew I didn't need to go to point to 1.0. But when you're down here around the periorbitals, you know, at 0.5, you, most of the time you're gonna get a nice, nice reaction, okay? All right, so that's perfect. So she's getting a nice reaction on both sides. Now what I do is I go from 0.5 here in the, uh, on the periorbitals. Most of the time, you're gonna have to go to about 1.0 on the crow's feet, as well as the cheek. I've never gotten a reaction at 0.5 on a cheek, ever. So be cognizant of that. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and dial up to 1.0 on the pen and we're gonna to start to do crow's feet. Crow's feet are easy and pain, painless. Patients, okay. I've done three or four passes at least. I'm not getting a reaction at one. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna push just a little bit harder. Not much, but just Okay, now watch, if you can see, I'm now getting the exact pinpoint bleeding I'm after. We're done. We move over to the next side. And knowing that I had to press a little bit on the other side, I'm gonna do that on this side. Okay. Perfect, pinpoint bleeding, we're done. We move on to the cheek now. So we're gonna start on this side. And go ahead and uh, blow your cheek out. This is key, have the patients like this, blow their cheek out. This is our, our area of treatment. And what you're gonna notice is that when she blows her cheek out like this, exactly, it creates just enough tightness of the skin now I'm at 1.0, I've done a pass. I'm not seeing a whole lot of my pinpoint bleeding. I take my pen, I dial it up to 1.5 like this. You don't have to tell the patient you're doing this, you just do it, okay? I grab a little bit more HA. 
And I had one clinician, clinician tell me, she maps it out. Like she goes down here, down here, up here like this, and like this a couple of times. So you have a red outline, and then you just work within that area. That was a great piece of uh, a technique there. So she's blowing her cheek out. And you notice that I'm not going from the jawline to the zygomatic bone. You work in areas, work in small parts. So right here is her jawbone, okay? So I'm just gonna do a small section like this. Now you guys can see even from afar, this is the reaction you want. When doing acne scarring, and I can't stress this enough, you wanna go as deep as possible. You may get this at 1.5, but if, you can if the patient can still tolerate it, you wanna to go to 2.5 on acne scarring and you wanna stamp it, okay? The idea is you wanna break up that scarring. So this is exactly the reaction we're after on the cheek, okay? So we're by and large, we're done. I'm gonna just kind of finish off down in here. And if you're ever doing this and you feel the pen start to catch, it just means grab some more HA, grab some more out of here. A lot of people, that nasal labial fold, you wanna go ahead and just get after it right here and just do multiple passes at your 1.5. Stay away from the upper lip, okay? But you wanna start that collagen induction, especially around the nasal labials, the marionettes down in here. And I'm gonna come up over here. Some people get a lot of that, that wrinkle right in here. Just get after it right here, okay? Perfect. And then I sit back and I kind of analyze. Okay, did I miss an area? Do I see an area that's not red? There's no pinpoint bleeding. What I'll do is then switch over and let's do this side. I'll do the, the map of the area that I'm gonna do. You want to make this skin nice and tight with your left hand. And patients like it when you have your other hand on their face in some capacity or another, whatever it is you're doing. Whether you're manipulating the skin, whether you're holding the cheek, whether you're just turning their head. It's a, it's a sense of comfort they have that knowing that you're fully engaged, okay? Okay. Now, here's a great example. I'm getting exactly the reaction I want on the cheek, but I'm looking here and I've noticed I've missed a whole section here. It's the section right on the cheekbone, okay? That's fine, but that's the whole point of analyzing. It's just sort of like a canvas, you're, you're the artist. Look and see where you may have missed an area or you need to go back and re reassess. So I'm gonna do just that. I'm gonna come up in here. Perfect, that's right on the cheekbone right here. So that's a little bit more difficult. You wanna make sure you assess just that. Okay, now what I do is I tend to, I, I rub the blood back in, okay? Now her skin is starting to get tight and it's starting to absorb a lot of that blood. Blood is good. This is exactly what you want when doing a microneedling. Here's, this is key to the procedure. We're gonna get ready to do upper lip. You never wanna mention that the upper lip is discomfortable or uncomfortable for the patient, okay? You just wanna do it and you wanna do it fast. So I'm gonna have you do this. Look. Yeah. So curl in the lips and here's how you do lips. You start in the middle, okay? And that's it. That can, can be that quick. Now, again, I was at 0.5 and I'm getting a nice reaction. Okay, you wanna be quick, in and out. They're gonna squirm, they're gonna squeam, they're gonna feel uncomfortable. I got my reaction and we're done. 
And then you can tell the patient, listen, upper lip is awful, I get it, I know, but we're done, the rest is downhill. Because all we have to do is this, okay? So, I come down here. Lower lip is nowhere near as painful as upper lip, okay? So I'm gonna come through here. Again, my left hand, manipulate the skin a little bit. If I need to turn her head this way or this way, that's what this hand does, okay? through here, just get right up onto the lower lip. Now, her chin is not as pronounced as many that you'll see. When you get that real pronounced, if they've had a chin implant or what have you, I find that the easiest way to work the chin is just to do a stamping method. You can do, you can do a circular motion if you want. That's not, you know, a, a, that's not against the rules, if you will. But what I find is that when you get down to a real pointy chin, you just do this, okay? And you're gonna do this as well on the tip of the nose, all right? So as you can see, we got our reaction there. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and do her nose. She doesn't need it, but I want, for technique purposes, I want you guys to see how you do a nose or one of the several techniques that you can use to do a nose. Is so we'll go ahead, dial it down to 0.5. The nose is uncomfortable. It's not necessarily painful, but most people have not had a vibrating cluster of needles on their nose. Some may sit up or stop and they want to sneeze. You know, these are things that happen when you do the nose. Start on one side, pull the nose a little bit. Again, I'm at 0.5. Okay, a little bit of pressure. And then you're going to start down here and you're just going to hold the nose like this. Okay. And then you're going to come over to this side. All right, and then we're gonna do the tip, like this, okay? Now, I look back and assess and I realize I could probably do a little bit more right here on this side, and I didn't get this area at all. So I'm gonna come up here and get this part. Okay, you can do the eyelids. I've done them quite a bit at 0.5. I've even gone to one and have not had any issues, but I'm gonna leave these for now as she doesn't need them. So we are done. That's a full face, okay? We're gonna go ahead and do her neck now. She's been numbed. Again, for a lot of the clinicians in the room, always be selling, always be upselling. Listen, you're in the chair now. If we just do neck, it's normally an extra $250, but you're here now. Let's go ahead and do it for 100. Are you in? Great, boom, you numb. We here at Cosmetical always numb the face and the neck, just in the event that we may go ahead and do that. So, just touch your head up. Necks are easy and they're quick, as are hands. So what we're gonna do is I'm down to 0.5. Okay. And you're going to get just under the jawbone like this and just do this ridge first. You would be amazed how many people have a scar right here, myself included, because they've either jumped on a ping pong table and it's closed up on them or they've fallen off their skateboard. You will find a ton of patients have a scar right here for one reason or another. And I'm going to do the one side first. I don't need to go all the way down and back and back and back. You can break it up. Let's do the upper part, portion of the, the, the neck first. Now, she is of the age that this neck is not really an issue. You will find some where you'll pull and I mean, you, you're really, you have a lot of skin to work with, okay? So microneedling in conjunction with Kybella, in conjunction with PDO threading is very effective for the neck. You want to take this hand, come down here, and just stretch the skin, and you've got a full canvas to work with. Notice the back of my pen right here. Okay, come up here. So I'm not getting 
the reaction that I want. So I'm going to dial this up to one. You don't have to notify the patient. You will find that when you're doing some patients and they have that leather skin, they've been out in the sun all their life, that this is like shoe leather. And you may be at 1.52 before you start getting this pinpoint bleeding, okay? I'm at one and I'm getting it. Okay, so then we're gonna move over and we're gonna do this side. I'm stretching the skin this way now, okay? Now for technique purposes, and again, she doesn't need it, but if she did, you're gonna have a lot of women that come in and want their decollete, their chest done. And the way you do that is you're gonna grab the upper portion of the breast and you're gonna push distally. That's gonna stretch the skin out and then you can really get after it on the chest, okay? So, we are finished with the process, with the procedure. We've done a face and we've done a neck. Okay, now her face is bleeding or it, it's on fire right now. It's, it's burning, it's hot. It's as like she's in a suntan lamp. This is crucial. It's obviously part of the healing process with the patients, but what you wanna make sure you do is now that I've created all these thousands of holes, is you wanna be very careful about what you put on the face immediately post procedure. So we have a growth factor, human growth factor infused mask, very similar to what we used to microneedle into her skin. We now have a mask that once you place the mask, take this and put it in the sharps. Once you place the mask, this is what patients are gonna remember when they walk out of your office, okay? Right now, she's, her face is, is burning, it's hot. She knows she got a great procedure. Now you wanna cool it down. Here is our growth factor infused masks. This is critical post-procedure, all right? So she's sitting here now, face is burning, face is getting tight. What patients remember when they walk out of here is this. They don't remember that, you know, the nose was uncomfortable or the upper lip was painful. They remember this, okay? So this is your, oh, this is our growth factor infused mask. Oh, and this has been in the fridge too. Mm. So we're gonna take this and You go ahead and just set it right down like this, okay? It's got eye slots. Smells good. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another key piece of advice. The upper is on. Now we're putting on the lower. So we put this down. Now, this is cold, and I'm telling you right now, do this, just work it. Talk to the patient, oh, you're gonna have a great effect, this is awesome, appreciate you coming in, and you're gonna be so happy and pleased. Whatever you gotta do, always keep your fingers on the face like this, and massage it. We were at your spa, and the woman that we did was like, uh, Ashley, Ashley, is that right? And she said, uh, just keep your hands on me. Just keep doing this. <laughs> Angie, yeah. Angie. She said, just keep doing this. So just do this. And you only need to do it for about, you know, eight to 10 minutes. This is the kind of the, the cooling down period. And just let them relax. Normally you've got some good Steely Dan playing, you know, just, and you just do this, okay? That's it. And just keep your hands on their face and just keep massaging and keep doing this. Because I could feel that her face is hot and now you have this ice cold mask on. It really transforms the whole experience for the patient. And that's what you want, is you want to enhance the patient experience, okay? So for the purposes of training, let's fast forward and pretend that this has been on her for 10 minutes. It's only been on for about four to five, but 
10 minutes. You're gonna go ahead and you're gonna peel this off. Okay. And then I take it and I just kinda get some of this dried blood off. Now, here's another thing that you can do. You take the remainder of the sleeve, okay, and watch this. When I tip it upside down, there's generally quite a bit of growth factor still in here that you can pour out onto the patient, okay? Now, the last piece that you want to do is what we have our take-home kit, our take-home care kit. Remember how I mentioned, we're done here, but we want to keep this skin hydrated. You have to keep the skin hydrated. This is the most important process of this procedure. If you do nothing else, just remember you've got to keep the skin hydrated. So at this stage, I'll go ahead and take my hands off, or take my glove off of here, and I'll grab, thank you. Here's the lipids, okay? I'm gonna put a squirt here. And again, this is all about hydration, okay? Our take-home care kit is $38. Obviously, for the patients, you wanna charge upwards of 50 or 60, at least, uh, if not more. Okay. Package pricing, how do you set this up? As I've preached and preached, and to those that know me and have seen me at uh, educational seminars, will agree, there is no better device in all of aesthetics that provides you a better ROI or an opportunity to make money than a microneedling device. And here's why. This entire kit, all said and done, our basic starter kit, which is everything you need to start going and doing microneedling, you have enough to do 15 procedures. Is That whole kit is $3,500. This procedure here is about 350, depending on where you are, with the wage index and what have you. What you want to do is you have a, a Vista Pen party, and you have all your clients come in. You serve some wine, you get them nice and, and and lubricated, and then you start having packages. Okay, so it's normally 300. <laughs> Stop. So, 300 dollars for a Vista Pen. So a packet of four is normally 1,200. But tonight, in tonight only, you can buy it for a thousand. Well, you get three to four clients like that, you've just paid for your entire device and you get that money up front. That's the beauty of microneedling, all right? That's the beauty of the Vista Pen. Is it approved for care credit? Uh, I don't think care credit matters what you're doing. Oh, it doesn't matter? Yeah. Oh, we can just swipe it for anything. Yeah. We can edit that out now. So, as you will notice throughout this entire training program, Either this hand or this hand has always been on the client, okay? Always. As we're talking and I'm answering questions, I'm constantly doing this. Because right now, I could stop, and within two minutes, her face is going to start to get tight. Because all those holes that we created will close up within about eight to ten minutes. So, you just want to keep doing this. Now, this is part of, sorry, this is part of the take-home kit, okay? This is the lipids. Now, what you want to do is you want to add the silicon spray. This is a protectant. So close your eyes. Okay. Just kind of rub this in. This is a protectant to obviously form a barrier with all any dust and dirt and germs and everything. Okay. Now, she is by and large, she's done. She's ready to go. Here's the finishing touch that I want you guys to all see and know and understand is we have what's called the cryo mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this mask is different than the growth factor infused, okay? So this mask is literally, once you peel it off the activation strip, and this is what your patients, you can sell to them to take home. These are $12 or a box of five is 60. These masks stored at room temperature once you peel it away from this activation strip here, these masks are freezing cold, okay? Again, this is all about the patient experience. You take this mask, and you just place it right there, okay? Yeah. And you take this piece. Now, this, is, this can be used anytime post-procedure. 
post laser, post chemical peel, post anything. It's just a cooling mask. There's no growth factor, there's, no, there's a little bit of HA, but by and large, it's just for cooling purposes, okay? And nothing else. But here's the beauty. Once you put this on, okay, she can now get up, walk around, drive home with it, all of that. These masks, obviously we just did a procedure, so there's a little bit of blood still when she peels this off in 25, 30 minutes. It stays cold for about that long. If you sell these to your patients to take home just on a nightly basis or a weekly, they can use it up to four times, putting it back on these activation strips and putting it back into the, can to the sleeve. Pull it out an hour later and it's cold, okay? That's the beauty of these. It can be administered at home. You saw my growth factor mask. It's very ooey gooey, everything like that. That's not a mask that you send home with the patient. They can't sit in the mirror and do it. It's very difficult. It's more for the clinician immediately post-procedure. This, she can get up and drive home and that mask isn't gonna move. And that concludes our segment. Any questions? Yes? How long do I go without makeup for? So the rule of thumb is 24 hours. What I tell my clients is obviously no makeup tonight. Yeah. Be very cognizant. Uh, the question was how long till I put makeup on. Uh, rule of thumb, you can put makeup on tomorrow when you go to work, okay? Not tonight. Just let this, let the skin do its, do its thing, its healing, all of that. When you get in the shower, be mindful that your face is going to burn. Just like if you have a sunburn, you touch the water, it feels great, and then you walk in it, and all of a sudden, just be mindful that your face is going to burn under a shower, on the warm water of a shower. Okay? So this take-home kit here is part of our Vistapen. This is what you want to take home or give to the patients to take home. The reason why is we've been doing this for about four and a half to five years now. And we had for the first several years, all of our clients saying, please give me something I can just hand to the patient to take home. That's what this is. This is your lipids and your silicon spray. $38, charge the patient whatever you need to charge them or bake it into the cost. Here, you take this home, use this for two to three days, several times a day, keep your face hydrated. Then you set this in the medicine cabinet, okay? When they come back for their next treatment in a month, if you can remember to tell them to bring it, or if they do, you never wanna rely on the customer to do this. But if they bring that, when you're done with your procedure, you then start using their same one. You don't need to sell this on every, if you can, great. The idea is this will last the four to six treatments necessary to get the full effect of the Vistapen. So tomorrow, wash my Tomorrow, face. do that in the morning, first thing. You know, wash your face, put that on. Lunchtime, uh, before dinner, after dinner, before bed, what have you. For about two days, do that. And then set that in your medicine cabinet and just let it sit in, in preparation for the next treatment you're gonna have in a month, okay? This takes a lot of the thinking this is not to supplant what the patient's normal skincare regimen is. That's not the idea here. The idea is hydration. Okay?